Thank you all for joining us for the 17th annual Noel Potter Lecture. My name is Pete Sack, and I'm a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences. And before getting to the main event, I wanted to acknowledge that Dickinson recognizes that we are located on unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived on these lands, as well as the thousands of Western indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as part of a federal cultural eradication effort. Now on to our main event. The Potter Lectureship was established by alumni, colleagues, and friends in 2004 to honor Emeritus Professor Potter, who retired in 2005 from Dickinson. George Lee, from the class of 1971, led the charge to raise a generous endowment from fellow alumni to fund this annual lecture in honor of Noel's 36 years of service to the college. During that time, Noel taught 3,178 students in physical geology and 233 majors in field and structural geology. Noel, could you please stand so we can acknowledge you or just wave whatever you feel up to? So are we. It is my pleasure to introduce our 17th annual Potter Lecture, Dr. Dorothy Meritz, Professor of Earth and Environmental Science at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. As a sidebar, that happens to be Noel's alma mater. Dr. Meritz is a geologist with an expertise in streams, rivers, and other landforms, and, and the impact of geologic processes, climate change, and human activities on the form and history of Earth's surface. Her primary research is in the Eastern United States. Her primary research in the Eastern United States is in the Appalachian Mid-Atlantic region, where she is investigating the role of human activities in transforming the upland woodlands and valley bottom wetland meadows of Eastern North America to a predominantly agricultural and mixed industrial urban landscapes since European settlement. The title of her talk this evening is When Natural Isn't What We Thought, But Matters to Dam Removal and Stream Restoration in Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Professor Meritz. Thank you, Pete, and thank you to the whole Department of Earth Sciences for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor. And of course, it's an honor to have anything to do with the legacy of Noel Potter. So thank you also for having me here as the 17th annual Potter lecturer. So it's something special to me. I really appreciate it. There's quite a bit I would love to say. Um, and I've thought long and hard about how to condense it into the time allowed here. Because the landscape around us in Pennsylvania has been greatly transformed. And it's, it's difficult to even explain to people how, how utterly unlike it it is today, how unla utterly unlike the original condition. We all know that trees have been removed for charcoaling, farming, etc. But it's much more than that. The, the valley bottoms in particular have been greatly altered by dams. And you can see one dam here in this opening shot. We're looking down from a drone at a dam on Chickies Creek, not far from Marietta, um, on, along the Susquehanna River. So Chickies flows into Susquehanna. And this dam is being removed in 2018. It's one of 52 dams in this small watershed. 10 still remain. They're all old. They're all historic. Most were associated with mills in the 17 and 1800s. They're obsolete, um, inactive today. They're safety hazards. They're barriers to fish passage. So there's a major push to remove them. And in this watershed of the 52, roughly one every mile or so, 10 still remain. One is, um, I'll show you one tonight that's failing and might fail even before it's officially removed. There are plans to remove it, but it is in, in great deterioration, a very deteriorated straight state at present. So this work that we're doing happens to be mostly in the Chesapeake watershed. And we recently received funding from the R.K. Mellon Foundation 
to develop a new Chesapeake Watershed Initiative. So much of what I'm talking about is with, done with my collaborators, Bob Walter, Mike Granis, Patrick Fleming, and others as part of that initiative. All right, what I'm gonna do next is show a few more views of this site. So you can see that the landscape has become heavily um, forested since the last 100 years, roughly. Prior to that, it had been deforested. It's still largely agricultural. But these dams remain that are altering stream flow, and behind them, there are great amounts of historic sediment stored in the valleys. So here's the dam before it was removed. And then after about a year of planning, in came the heavy equipment. American Rivers sponsored um, and did, was in charge of this removal, working with Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Um, and we were there as researchers monitoring what happened. So what they do is they, they make a, a slot, and the water begins to pour through. And then they remove the rest of the dam and have what is hoped to be something akin to a naturally flowing river. And there we are looking down on it as the water begins to flow through where there had been a barrier previously just flowing over that. So Lancaster County, it turns out, leads the nation in, Pennsylvania leads the nation in, in low head dam removal. These are these low, old, historic mill dams. Lancaster County leads the state. So this is, and there's a major movement going on. I'll show some data about this soon. A major movement to tear down old dams. And Pennsylvania continues to lead the way on this. This is a written, an article written in 2015. So I'll be talking about that, about dam removal in general. And then I'll point out um, some of the work of American Rivers, excuse me, and I'll, I'll talk about this idea of a free-flowing natural river. And um, I'll talk about um, how what's happening as the dams are removed. A typical historic map for Pennsylvania, and even Maryland and other states in the eastern US, would show that in the 1800s and even 1700s, there would be one dam after another. People heavily utilized streams for water power. This was a major deal for them. I often say it was like their fossil fuels. This is how they got the majority of the power they were using and it was industrialized, even though it looked kind of bucolic. It's an industrialized landscape. And we often forget about these today when you just see something like what I showed in that drone image, a remnant historic dam just sitting obsolete in the landscape. We've mapped these dams in about 10 counties. So in Google Earth, we can, I can share this file if you'd like. Mike Ronis has put this all together, one of our collaborators. So this would be Baltimore County here, for example and then Chester County, Lancaster County, York County, et cetera, Cumberland County. And we've done it even for counties farther west. So you can see that there were thousands of these and that the pattern was similar. This altering of the landscape was very similar and had, it been done, had it already been done in Europe throughout Germany and France and England. It was a very similar way of interacting with the landscape and altering it and altering it for centuries. With trees, trees can grow back within a period of years, but with dams, sedi the sediment trapped there, the alteration of the waterways has profound impacts for centuries. And I'll show that. So here's a, the Chickies watershed. The dam that I showed at the beginning was dam number three. It was removed, as I said, in 2018, but there were, at the time of this map, and we made this several years ago, we thought there were 48 dams. We now know there were 52. The more we looked, the more we find. So one every six square kilometers. The, the volume of sediment stored behind these dams is on average 270,000 cubic meters and multiply it by 1.3 to get tons approximately. It's a lot of sediment. Imagine just how much erosion had to have occurred to have gotten that much sediment in the valley bottoms. And we get something on the order of five centimeters of landscape lowering throughout the entire watershed. So we're gonna go now, let me go back and show you, excuse me. We're gonna go to dam number 16 up in the headwaters of Chickies Creek, just to show you what some of these ponds look like. So here's a road, and here's the dam. The flow is to the lower right. You can see this pond was immense, and this is in 1842 when it's already filled in quite a bit with sediment. We have quite a bit of data in Pennsylvania, especially after about 1895 or so. The state began inspecting all the dams after the Johnstown flood. So we have quite a few written records, reports, and even in 20th century, including early 20th century photographs of many dams and ponds. And they'll talk about the fact that ponds are filled with sediment. Three meters is a typical dam height. And so you can see the pond there, and now I'm going to show you what it looks like at different points in time. 
And, and notice too, by the way, the backwater effects. The, the damming impacted tributaries coming into that main stem. There are people enjoying the pond in the early 1900s, people riding around in their boat on the pond in the early 1900s, when it was still probably accumulating some sediment, net depositional. And there it is in, the 19, in 1925. So the dam's right here. There's a road um, right over the dam. And here's the mill down here. So there's the pond as of that time. There it is in 2016. So going back and forth, you can see quite a difference because the pond had filled with sediment. And during Hurricane Agnes, the, the dam partially breached, only partially, about half of the height of it, and only in the very middle. And there's a culvert there now. So there is a channel, a narrow and sized channel. And that's the immediate response to dam failure is the channel cuts down. So the pond goes away, the shallow water on top of that filled reservoir of sediment, and then a stream cuts down through that. And we've begun to think that's just normal and natural because it's so common. But something happened prior to all that sediment accumulating. So let's go look now at a dam that has not yet failed, but it is deteriorated greatly. This is dam number seven on that, in that same watershed. And we learned about it two or so years ago because it is failing. It's slated for removal. All the permitting's in the works. There have been many studies. We've been part of those studies for the last two years. But it has not yet been removed. The pandemic did slow that down. So this reservoir, because there's still a dam there, which has not yet completely failed, um, has no channel incision, no what I'll, I'll talk about nick points later, no bank erosion. So it's much like that previous pond. So here we go, we're downstream, and let me see if I can figure out how to get my video to go. So we're downstream, and we're going up the valley, and notice there are no high banks. That's the key thing to keep in mind, no high banks of sediment, valley sides coming in, kind of sloping towards the bottom. And then we get to the dam. The mill was at one time on the left, another time on the right. It's hundreds of years of history. There was a tavern that during the Revolutionary War, people, hung, all the soldiers hung out there. And now we're going up and over this dam. It was originally about 10 to 12 feet high. And we're in the pond now. But this is not the original pond. This is the pond that's left today after partial dam failure in the 1930s, 1920s to 30s. So this terrace, I call it a terrace over here in the distance, that's the former top of the pond back when the dam was higher. The dam was rebuilt in the 1920s or early 30s, but not as high as the original dam. So you can see some low banks there. Now we're going to get back down over the dam. And what I want you to focus on then is the fact that there's a step in the landscape. And we're up on that 10-foot step. And that step is sediment that was trapped over hundreds of years. And probably it was done trapping sediment as of 100 years ago or so. That's where it's failing, right over there where this large concrete block, which was part of the repairs in the 30s, is at risk of dropping. And there's actually water flowing over here behind that block and coming out down and under that block. So that's the reason for wanting to repair this dam or to remove the dam. So it'll be removed. The question is, how do you remove a dam like that when the valley behind it is so filled with sediment? So here's a view of the dam showing that it's filled with sediment to the brim of the dam. So you can see it on the right, you can see it on the left. There is a shallow slough of water upstream. We've done bathymetry here. We're working with Stantec Engineering, who's doing um, a lot of the assessment for the dam removal. So the, the, the concern is, how do you remove a dam like this and not have the roughly 130,000 cubic meters or so of sediment unleashed? when the state of Pennsylvania is trying very hard not to add more sediment, fine sediment, it's largely fine. We've cored and drilled here, up and up throughout the slough from a boat, Stantec did this, and then over on the left and right, um, we cored and drilled many, many sites. We're also working with folks at University of Delaware on this. All the cores go down about 12 feet and they're filled with silt and clay. And under that is the original valley bottom, a dark organic rich soil. So 12 feet of silt and clay, you can imagine what this might look like if that dam is removed. But in addition to dam removal, their dams fail on their own. So it could happen either way. See the yellow lines 
what we're going to do now is look at the impact of the sedimentation behind these dams along the long profile, along an imaginary yellow line. So that line would be going along the stream. On the left is a plan view of the, of the stream, from the mouth down here up to dam number seven. That roller mill dam is dam number seven near Mannheim. So it's dam number seven. So along that blue line, we use LIDAR data, and we've created this blue line, which is the water surface. So if we go up to dam number seven, you can see the water jumping up that roughly eight to 10 feet here. The yellow line above it is that terrace that had the trees growing on it. And because there were so many dams, you can see one after another kind of, they called it mill crowding actually. Eventually the states had to pass mill crowd in the colonies, mill crowding acts, to stop people from building so many mill dams. It was impacting the, the, tech, uh, the industry. So each of those terraces, as I've shown here with these yellow polygons, is a wedge of sediment behind those dams. So we'll go look, in a moment I'm going to show you this he stand dam at the mouth of Chickies. I'll show you a view from that. All right, so dam removal is increasing with time, as you can see in this graph from roughly 1944 to 2014. And also there are more studies done with time. That's this histogram down here. So the number of dams removed per year is growing, number of studies is growing. Um, and what we have learned is that there are more dams than we can ever determine. There are so many of them. And there was a study that just came out where folks used LIDAR and other data in the Hudson watershed, and they figured out that they had undercounted the known dams. There were, there were, there were nine times more dams that they knew about than they knew about, <laughs> and we're not surprised. But many of these things breach on their own and have breached, so we already have whole watersheds. Chickie's watershed has 52 dams, 42 are breached already. So there's already a lot of erosion of sediment going on. And there's Pennsylvania leading the mid-Atlantic region with the most number of dam removals, 276 as of 2014. And the reason for that is not just that we have a lot of dams, we do. We have a lot because they began inspecting them after the Johnstown flood, which was a dam failure and killed thousands of people in the late 1800s. So they began keeping track of the dams. They determined they had between 8,000 and 16,000 in the state of Pennsylvania. And they began inspecting them and telling people you had to maintain them if you owned them. And many people had no idea how they even ended up with a mill dam, but they own the lands. They have a mill dam and a reservoir. And Pennsylvania has a formal dam removal program and a permitting process, and they have allowed passive sediment management, which means you can just remove the dam. That's passive sediment management. There's no need to manage it, just remove the dam, because on its own it will work, it'll work things out, it'll heal itself somehow and become a naturally flowing stream again. All right, so. American Rivers has a really nice map. You can go and check it out. Um, it's interactive, and you can zoom in and see all the dams that have been removed. And one of those is one that Noel and I have worked on. It's the Eaton Dykeman Dam on Mountain Creek. I won't take time to go to that American Rivers interactive map. But you can go there and find that. That move, dam was removed in 1985, and I will talk about it in a few moments. First, probably the most shocking thing I'll show tonight is what happened a year ago in August when a dam in someone's backyard failed, all right? So what you're going to see in a small watershed, unnamed, it's an unnamed watershed, it's in the headwaters in Lancaster County near Strasburg, a small stream that goes into Beaver Creek. It was built in the 1700s, and last year in August, August 13th, it failed during a storm. The homeowner was standing on her deck and videotaped it. It's the only video I know of a dam failure in this region. I have video from drones of dam removals, but this is not a failure I know of. So here goes. And when I show it, I'm going to show it along with a video of a laboratory experiment of dam removal. It was done by Alessandro Contelli. And so it's on the left. And he did this as part of a postdoc where he was building fake dams and sediment and then breaching them and monitoring the response. And the response is, just to give you some insights to it, response is first, and you'll see this, um, the dam breaches, there's incision and a nick point forms. And the nick point is a steep part right up here. And it's migrating upstream. And as it migrates, the banks are eroding. Now on the right, you'll see this dam fail. Oh my God! 
So it'll, it will loop for a few minutes, and you'll see what's happening downstream. It's a very small stream. It was a 20-foot dam for a mill. But key things to notice here are downstream near the dam, there are high, now high banks after dam failure. Those high banks are eroding, as you can see there. And sediment's being washed away as a consequence. This is passive sediment management, right? <laughs> now, we don't know what exactly was there before there was a dam, but that dam completely spans the valley, and that is extremely typical. They cross the valley. My partner and husband, Bob Walter, likes to say, that's because they really didn't have streams to dam. They had lots of marshes and meadows and things like that. They had to dam the valleys. So and it's the same thing with the Grand Canyon, for, or I'm sorry, for the Colorado at Hoover Dam. They, it spans the whole valley, right? It goes from one wall to the other. So this dam used to start over here, went all the way over there. And eventually, as the pond filled in, the miller dug out some of the sediment and built this ramp down here. So when, and then this original 20-foot dam, when it failed last year, it cut down. It had already been partly breached down a few feet. It cut all the way down and began to drain this pond. So there's just a skinny neck of land left here. So let's go see now how this looks back a year ago. We'll go zooming in. So the, the homeowner was taking the video from that deck right there. And we'll zoom down close to take a look. And notice this skinny little channel that has formed. So it's just cut down after all those trees fell in. And it has a series of steps or nick points. And they made it to about up, about up to there. When I walked up in there, it hadn't made it all the way up and through yet. So it's still responding like in that laboratory flume model, that physical model. So there's that skinny little channel. I'm going to show then how it looks now. We've been going out there the last few weeks. And that's on the right, the bottom. So that's how it looked last week in comparison. And a lot of the trees have fallen in, so you can actually see the pavilion they have. And on the left, then, I show what's called a channel evolution model, showing that when a reservoir has a dam removed or, or breached by failure, you get the incision, the nick point, which would be up there. And then this nick point keeps working its way headward. And eventually, the stream cuts all the way down to the base. And that's what's happened here. It's cut all the way down through. In fact, in through all the historic sediment, down below into the pre-colonial settlement sediment, and down below that even into old Pleistocene periglacial colluvium from the last ice age. And it picks that stuff up and begins to make big gravel bars. So now we're going to fly through here, just so you can see what this looks like. So this, was, this is a channel one year after dam failure, high eroding banks. There's just a skinny little neck of land there over to the pond. This bank here, as you can see, was collapsing when I was there. I was walking along as well as the drone flying. And sometime around here, I began to think, it's really not the safest place to be. And you can see that the channel is getting more and more narrow and more steep. We're going over a series of nick points. So there's Bob and Patrick Fleming, and they're showing that it is indeed a 20-foot high dam. A lot of the blocks here are from the dam failure, and we see that at many sites we go to where there's just a lot of coarse, bouldery material below a dam failure site. So a small stream. It's not very, it looks like a big stream because the banks are so high. And I like this view here because it shows so clearly this is finely laminated mill pond mud. You only get lamini like that, these fine layers in a pond environment. And under it, there's a dark organic rich soil, which would be the soil that the settlers built the dam atop. And below that, all this quartz rich gravel is Pleistocene colluvium, which I'll talk about again in a few moments. Looking back towards the house, there's a view on the left from a year ago, right after failure, a view on the right. And then we'll back up, oops, um, just to show you then how much larger the channel was. Let's go to the mouth of Chickies now. It was removed, that dam was removed in 2015. So it's had six years of channel incision, nick point retreat, and bank erosion. There it is being removed in 2015. And there it is two years later when they were having some bank erosion problems and put large stone blocks in to make walls. So the dam's down here in the lower left. And then along came some storms in 2018, and the walls are gone. 
And you can see remnants of one of those walls here. We can't even find remnants of it over here. And it continues to erode. So they put more and more riprap out. And upstream, the erosion continues way upstream because the former mill pond was almost a mile in length. And under all that mill pond mud, I'm going to show you in a moment, we're going to go upstream up beyond the bridge, and I'm going to show you what we found under, at the very bottom of the mill pond mud, the very bottom. So what percent of the sediment is gone from that reservoir? It's hard to say, but here we are upstream of the bridge, and I found this site. I was up there walking while we were, the students were flying the drone, and under there I kept seeing weird things sticking out, like feet. It looked like feet. So I reached under the water, and there they are, their shoes. And I'm pulling them out. They are leather shoes, and they are early colonial leather shoes. They're all the same. There's no left and right. So they're down there in the mill pond mud for some reason. Now, this was an industrial site. People were making hemp there and doing all kinds of other things. Um, this is early on that this probably all happened. The site where Noel and I have worked, and many others have worked with us, is on Mountain Creek, not far from here, near Mount Holly Springs, the Eaton Dykeman Mill Dam. And we like that site because it was removed by the state in 1985. We have extensive records on this site from the state files. We have lots of photographs, lots of reports. But what is especially good for us is we like to look at sites that where we know when the dam failed. And we can say, here's how much has happened. Here's how much is gone of the sediment in that time period. And here's how the stream is responding. And we can tell others then. If you just remove the dam, this is likely to be what will happen. This is what happens with passive sediment management. So there's an air photo of the site in 1968. The dam was about 700 feet long. Flow would be bottom to right, bottom to top, bottom left to top right. And after it was removed in 1985, we began working there in the early 2000s. And Noel told us about it. And we eventually put in some cross sections. So when they removed the dam, they removed a little bit of it right over here, about 50 feet of it, and it cut down. And I'll show photos of that. And there's a channel now cutting through the pond sediment. And all of this is pond sediment going upstream. And the channel has cut through all that sediment and across the valley and then continues on up the valley here. So we had these four cross sections to try to monitor what's happening with time. So in that image on the right, 18 years after dam breaching. So in our channel evolution model then, I put Eaton Dykeman here. This is that site right after they removed the dam, one month later. And somebody wrote on the photo, erosion. And up here they wrote, former lake. And you can see up at the top here, this is the former lake in 1919. And there's the dam in 1982. And here it is nine months after that dam was removed. And remember, they only removed 50 feet of the 700, and they removed it on one side of the valley at one tip. Here it is 24 years later. Here, Noel and I are standing looking at it. It was a 13-foot high dam. So we can learn a lot. What, one of the things we have learned is that the banks can remain vertical for decades, hundreds of years, in fact. They can remain vertical as they erode. So in that pond then, when, as they removed the dam, so various views, 1915, 16, 84, there's still a big lake there. When they removed the dam, the lake drained away, the sediment began to dry out quite a bit, and the channel cut down over on the right, and then began eroding. So we published a paper on this. Um, it was one of a number of dams we talked about. So Noel and I and others as co-authors, and we referred to it as the rise and fall of mid-Atlantic streams. There were so many of these dams, streams rose up regionally and then cut back down regionally, first with the dam building and the reservoir sedimentation and later with dam either removal or failure. But there's a, there are several great problems with all of this, challenging, vexing problems that we hope to come up with good solutions for. The one is the sheer amount of sediment, and it's very fine grain typically. But the other is the nature of the sediment. So you can see that in that Eaton Dykeman pond, there's this thick stack of historic sediment. But under it, there's something else. And that perplexed us. Bob and I actually went out there during our spring break one year in March and scraped this whole thing clean. <laughs> it took days just to get these good photos and samples. And we radiocarbon dated this stuff. This is old. This is Pleistocene colluvial material. But as we follow it across the valley, we come to other things. Um, 
it says a variety of things, a hodgepodge of things down there. The, the landscape was complex and it was um, heterogeneous. So there were these mounds, I call it a, the mogul landscape, like a ski mogul landscape, mounds of rubble from Pleistocene cold conditions. You can see them also right here. So these ups and downs, undulatory landscape. And then low spots filled in with lacustrine lake sediments. And low spots filled in with spring-fed marshes where bog turtles hang out, endangered species. Um, not back then. So that's the historic part there. But when these streams cut down, because they're in these narrow slots, they cut right down, they have very high shear stresses, right down through the stuff underneath, and they pick up that gravel. Not all of it, some of it's too big to be carried, but they pick up quite a bit. And they move it along, and then they make these very powerful streams um, because of the high banks, with big gravel bars because of the access to that place to seeing gravel that's down there. What we often see right on top of this early former landscape is a lot of leaves. And these are leaf mats. And notice there are hardly any leaves going up through this section because we think the trees were gone <laughs> by the 1800s. They were, this area, was the, um, trees were cut down for charcoaling. And notice from the left was all that rubble, but on the right, there's this very fine grain. We date rated, carbon dated this. It's like several thousand years old, kind of some sort of wet, marshy, pond-like environment. Look at the seeds in it. So that's down there. If we make a cross section here on cross section two at that site, so cross section two from left to right, flow going downstream, you can see the high bank that is eroding with time. And Noel put in erosion pins, these long rebars, and monitored that erosion. And you can come down that near vertical bank, and the stream is cut into this underlying rubbly material, which is now moving, and it's building these big gravel bars, like that one on the right. And then on the other side, back up, there's that fine sediment again. So it's completely changed the, the dy dynamics of this stream. I refer to them as anthropogenic streams or anthropocene streams. There was nothing like it prior to dam building. And the sediment, if you do grain size analysis showing from small on the left to big on the right and per how percentage of sediment it's that fine, the mill pond sediment's really fine grain, mostly silt. This is actual data. And then the Pleistocene colluvium way over here is really coarse. So it has stuff up into the cobble size, large cobble, small boulder. The gravel bar is pretty coarse, but not as coarse, but it's coming from that old Pleistocene colluvium. You can't make a gravel bar out of mill pond mud, right? So, and then in between there are these kind of sandy, wet meadow soils and lake sediments. Luna Leopold, very well-known scientist, um, son of Otto Leopold. Luna Leopold worked at streams throughout the, the United States and wrote books about them, including one called View of the River. And he worked at a site in Maryland known as Watts Branch, which I'll show next, but it's not far from this site in Maryland, where he saw, he didn't fully understand the role of damming, but he knew there was historic sediment in the stream banks. He knew they were eroding rapidly, and he studied that and did some great work. He did notice what we've noticed, this rubble down here. And he was perplexed by it. And he said, it's rotten, decomposed, unsorted regolith, angular rocks, no bedding, no rounding, no, strat no stratification. You know, it doesn't look at all like what you'd expect to see in a river. Some of it's big. Maybe it's relict. Maybe it is unrelated to the present river regimen. So he understood, he had an inkling, there was something odd about these streams. And the only way to get them is to fill the valley with sediment in a, behind a dam, and then have the dam fill or get removed and cut down through and get such high banks, the stream could actually cut into that old Pleistocene stuff. And he was right. It's unrelated to the present river. The present river is the youngest thing out there. This stuff is over 10, 12,000 years old and it's associated with frost cracking and freeze thaw processes. It's matrix supported, meaning that, and here it is on a hill slope. If you go up the hill slopes, you find this stuff, and we're doing a lot of work with this. I'll talk about it tomorrow morning for a class. This is stuff that moved down the hillsides when permafrost thawed. The region all the way down to what's now Annapolis was frozen much of the time, the last million years. And it had permafrost like in Siberia or the Arctic regions. And when that permafrost thawed, all the stuff at the surface could flow down slope, flows like icing on a cake when it's melted. And we see it in the valley bottoms. And we can see from LIDAR data, this is a slope shade, that these things that flowed, that previous photo was number one, they had these lobate tongue-like shapes. 
They're called fingering instabilities. But so this bouldery stuff can actually flow. So I've been proposing that we look at um, Luna's work, A View of the River, and I'd like to publish a book someday called Changing Views of the River and focus on the fact that with originally wet meadows formed on Pleistocene colluvium and then mill dams, we get very different rivers, but they weren't clearly recognized until our work largely. It wasn't clearly recognized how they become the way they've become, in part because when you stand there in the stream banks, it's hard to imagine that so much of the stuff there wasn't from the stream we see today. And, and that's a key point. The stream we see today, like at that sides mill dam that failed last year, that stream didn't exist until this year. It wasn't there before. There was a valley bottom filled with sediment behind a dam. So it's young. All right, so in Watts Branch, where Luna had worked with um, many others over the years, they did what Noel does and I do and what Pete and others will do, will do where we, we survey cross sections and we monitor the rate of bank retreat. It's very important work because by doing that, we begin to understand rates of things and then eventually, by looking at what they're made of and what, you know, the timing of things, the ages of things, we begin to figure out how these valleys have been transformed over time. And Luna actually knew that this valley flat, he called it the valley flat here, was even that was somehow unlike the modern stream. He was getting it so close to it, he just didn't know that there was a dam where he was working. It turns out, just downstream of that photo there, there on the left, the, the flow's coming towards us. Just downstream, there was, let me get to it, a mill building and a mill dam. And we learned about this at the Smithsonian, where they told us that this painting existed, and we got to go and see it, so we took this photo of the painting. But Luna didn't know that, and he did all his cross-sections right in here, not knowing his stream channels were in this former mill pond and had cut down into it, and this is that site, cut down into it, and it gone through the historic sediment into the Holocene as the last 10,000 years or 11,000 years of wet meadow soils and into the underlying colluvium. It is now making these big gravel bars. This stream was restored at a cost of 1.6 million to try to stabilize the banks and slow down that erosion. All right, so the last example is on Indian Run in northern Lancaster County, Stober's Mill Dam. I have hundreds of examples I could show you. I've selected these for various reasons. This one I've selected because I'm going to show you how we quantify rates of erosion. All right, so first, here's the dam on the upper left, 1915. People sitting there for scale. And on the right, a very similar view, actually. So those people would have been sitting right over here. We're looking upstream. The dam failed in 2011 and cut down rapidly. And I won't show you all the photos, but before that, there was a big pond there. People t tell us about swimming in it in the early 1900s, people in their 80s and 90s now. They tell us about canoeing in it. But it was roughly filled with sediment with shallow water at the top. And it incised, and it cut, there it is in the upper right before it cut down. So here's a 2008 um, DEM made from Pennsylvania DCNR LIDAR data showing that this dam was four meters high, there's a four meter step, and that there was this tiny little channel, you can see it right in here, because the dam had partly filled, just a tiny bit, tiny channel, kind of draining across the top of the pond. So remember my video in the beginning where the, the drone comes up and goes up and over that dam? Same thing here, we'd come upstream and go up and over that four meter high dam. Now we're gonna look at 2014 LIDAR, airborne LIDAR, so LIDAR laser mapping from an airplane. And there is a big channel that's cut down, that's this channel. And there's a nick point propagating upstream and going up, in fact, the main stem and the tributary. And if you go all the way up here, which we've done, there's no channel yet, very, li very little channel. But meanwhile, the landowner down here was very upset about all this and had a huge mess. A lot of sediment came down to his property, just like with the landowner at Sides Mill Dam. And if we difference those two, just take the two grids of data and subtract one from the other, everything in red is where there's been erosion. So we estimated in that time period from 2011 until 2014, 40,000 tons of sediment was eroded. Now, when we tell folks about this, such as folks at USDA, Natural Resources Conservation Service, who are busily trying to get farmers to implement best management practices on the hill slopes, they're very concerned to learn 
that one dam failure resulted in 40,000 tons of erosion and sediment, fine sediment, going into the waterways. And they're more concerned when they learn that there are hundreds of these. And even more concerned when they learn some of them are actually being deliberately removed with passive sediment management. But what can we do about it? These dams are failing. They are safety hazards. And we now know from monitoring enough of them that if we start with when the dam failed or was removed, time zero, and go out 20, 40, 60, 80 years, et cetera, as we go out in time, the rate of erosion does slow down. It slows down pretty substantially in the first 20 years. However, it's still many tons of sediment a year. It's just a lot more in the first five years or so. The reason for that difference is initially banks are just collapsing and calving, like in the drone video I showed of the Seismo Dam failure. And then with time, as it widens out and the stream cuts all the way down in, like at Eaton Dykeman, it starts to meander around and get gravel bars and so forth. So Eaton Dykeman would be right here where on the green dots. There's still erosion, but it's not like a beginning when you had this narrow slot with banks collapsing like icebergs calving off. We've predicted then um, that if you take all the numbers of breaches of dams in a given watershed, and this could be breaches or removals, and, and just say here's 10 dams removed you know, or breached, 10, 15, go all the way from 1900 up to the future, 2200 from year, year 22 AD, with time there's going to be this increasing length of incised channel as all these streams cut down and work the nick points all the way upstream. And if we then take along that length those erosion rates that we've carefully measured, keeping in mind that they do diminish with time, and you run that model, you get a lot of sediment over time that will take centuries to diminish, unfortunately. But what can we do about it? So there's the dam on Deniger's Mill that was removed but failed 100 years ago. So it's this data point way out here. So the erosion rates are relatively low because that dam failed so long ago, but if you look at that, everybody would probably agree it looks like it's eroding, right? It's just, it's actually not eroding as fast as some of our other sites. <laughs> at that site, we are over there extracting, this is just a few weeks ago, but we've, done, we've worked here for 20 years. We've extracted a black soil, which is all the way under this mill pond mud for a long ways. We've pulled out seeds and also has a leaf mat right on top of it. And worked with Peter Wolf and his students at Penn State and we reconstructed the environment based on those leaves of those trees and the seeds of the various sedges that were existing. And Peter's wife is an illustrator, and she created this image of what that landscape looked like. So it was small channels, marshes, um, spring-fed marshes, uh, and then surrounded by tree, tree types that are a little different than today. Some of the same trees exist, but not in, in the abundance as now. So what, what can we do? Well, we've learned, how can, what can, we can't go back, right? We can't take all that sediment away easily and make it look like it used to look. But we know it used to look like that. And at sites where the banks aren't as high, we can scrape away and we can see, yeah, that black soil is kind of ubiquitous. And it's feeding, it's fed by springs. Can we recreate that? Can we uncover one of these buried wetland floodplain systems and recover it. Can we recover the ecosystem functions of a wetland floodplain aquatic system? Yes, in this case we did. Um, I would say it is a, now a healthy, free-flowing river. <laughs> this is going back to the quote from the beginning, the newspaper article. Um, so yes, it took us many years. Our target is this. This is one site we know of in Great Marsh, Pennsylvania, Chester County. One site we know of that was never dammed. <laughs> So it's a vast, one of the biggest marshes in the state of Pennsylvania, but it never had a dam. The surrounding hills were all cleared of trees. It was all logged and, for, and farmed, but it never had a dam. So the valley did not fill with 10 or 20 feet of sediment. From the air, it looks like that. Now it does have some ponds and channels which various owners tried to create over time with dynamite and dredging. They actually tried to dredge and drain the marsh and put cows out there wasn't very um, effective, wasn't very sustainable. So what we have been working on with land studies is taking sites that look like the upper left, remove all the historic sediment, and create sites like the lower right. And it might sound a little bit far-fetching, but we've done it at many places. Um, my group focuses on the science. Part of that land studies the engineering. And land studies has done this 
at sites that are 10 miles, in, I think up to 10 miles in length in western Pennsylvania, places where there had been underground coal mining. At Big Spring, this is how it looked before we removed the sediment. There had been a tree planting there to try to stop the bank erosion. We removed the sediment, and initially it looked like that, and then it looked like that a year later, and then like that a few years later, and like that a few years later after that. So we did the restoration in 2011. We removed 20,000 tons of historic sediment, and it's now on the Franklin and Marshall campus at the new ball fields. So Science Magazine last year ran a really nice story about this work, and that is the, the Big Spring site, looking downstream along it. Unrestored down here, where it's a straight, um, well, it's partly meandering, eroding channel. But in this stretch from here up to here, it is restored to something like what I showed you in that colorful illustration. So to conclude, there is tremendous value in doing what Noel and Pete have done, and others have done here at um, Dickinson, which is monitor these streams. Luna Leopold also promoted this, this idea. Just monitor them, try to understand them, keep track of what they're doing. So here are cross sections of their meander project for a site not far from here. They now have, what, 48 years of data. And by doing that, collecting that data and trying to understand these systems, we come up with, over time, many new ideas and have insights on how to, how to actually restore some of these sites for those that might need some restoration, those that are contributing sediment to the waterways. So I like the part of this paper near the end talking about how that project continues, even with Noel retired. There are new people, new ideas. And today they were telling me about using a robot um, total station to try to survey this, this stream, and we're now discussing doing it at Eaton Dykeman take the robot total station and continue these surveys. And for some of them where there have been dams, piece it all together into this history that's changing our views of our waterways and what they might have been like formerly, how they got the way they are today. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much again for inviting me. Has any questions for Dorothy? I'm sure she'd be eager and happy to answer some. And we're also streaming the event, so I'm going to ask that you use the microphone so people elsewhere will be able to hear the questions and respond to them. I do have a question to start off. So you, you talked about how many more dams like this we have in PA versus states like Maryland, New Jersey, um, and some of our neighbors. Certainly, PA is much, much larger than those states. Is there a difference in the dam density per area? So the mapping is different. We have township maps in Pennsylvania, and we use the township maps to map the dams. So we're able to get a fairly fine scale map, and, and a lot of mapping was done in Pennsylvania. I don't know why. Maybe it was a wealthier state. I'm not sure of that, or maybe they prioritized that. But we have good data. and then. Because of the Johnstown flood, the state of Pennsylvania required owners to maintain the dams. As far as we know, no other state did that as of the late 1800s, early 1900s. No other state was saying, you must maintain those old obsolete dams. In Maryland, we've also mapped dams in Maryland and in New Jersey and Delaware. Um, we find different uh, qualities of mapping, historic mapping. So Maryland has districts. And often it's zoomed pretty far out, and you just see a bunch of little dots in their dams. But we think there'd probably be more dams if we could get a, a finer scale mapping. But it also seems to be the case that in Maryland, many more dams were destroyed or failed in the 1800s. And some were destroyed during the Civil War. So it seems as if they had fewer dams left by 1900 of their original dams. Because when we plot up the long profiles, we can still see that many of the streams had one dam after the other, but many of them have been breached for a long time. There aren't as many left. Did I answer all parts of your question, or was there another part at the end there? Okay. Hi. 
name is Liz Berg. I'm actually an F and M alum from 2012. I, I remember your classes. Yeah. 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 Hi, um, Liz, it's good really to see encouraging you. to see how Big Spring Run turned out because I remember you were doing that research yeah. when I was a student. Um, I think I actually got to go to the site. You did I remember classes? Um, but I'm just curious. Like it's really encouraging to see how that site turned out. How do you work with landowners and like educate? The general public about why this is good because I'd imagine that that would be really hard to like alter someone's landscape um, but to teach them that hey this is actually like the original landscape and this is really good. It's a wonderful question. Um, Patrick Fleming is an economist and he is, has been working with us for several years now including at Big Spring Run to look at the economic um, incentives and benefits of doing this approach to restoration. And we published a paper together with him. He was lead author. He came out of agricultural economics. He studied at the University of Maryland. So he well knows the Chesapeake Bay watershed model and all the credits you get for different land use practices for reducing sediment and nutrients to the bay. And he looked closely at this particular approach and very closely and rigorously and, and was able to show that even though it costs a lot up front, and I'll get to the landowner part of it next, but it costs a lot up front. But in the end, the benefits far outweigh those of other best management practices that might have, that would never have probably the equivalent reduction of nutrient and sediment loads. So even if you can show people that, which he, he thinks from some of his experiments with landowners that that might, alone might convince some of them, certainly it would convince the state and federal government to give credits for these things. But even so, there's still this issue of, well, somebody has to agree to let that happen to their land. This particular landowner at the time was very willing to have that happen. They had planted those trees and most had died. The banks were still eroding. Um, and then the land was sold during restoration and the current landowners also are extremely supportive and, and kind and allow us to come out there and continue to work there and do a lot of research there. We have three USGS gauge stations there. For other landowners, um, it's surprising how many are willing to do these sorts of things. At the Sides Mill Dam site, their dam failed. They have a pretty substantial problem right now. They've gotten some grants. They've worked with land studies to get grants to go in there and do some type of restoration slash repair work. Sometimes they almost have to. The people who own that roller mill dam is failing. They want something to happen. They don't want to have a horrible mess on their land when the dam is removed. The people who live along the sides of that valley don't want high banks of mud, 12-foot banks of mud. So there are incentives that will lead people to make decisions that will also have ecological benefits and, and reductions, end up reducing sediment loads to the bay, for example. I think it's going to take 50 years of ex people shifting their views on what's acceptable, what's reasonable. With our new funding from the R.K. Mellon Foundation, we are working with Patrick um, in particular to do not only the scientific research that I talked about, but scientific research on human behavior and how to get people to understand that there are benefits to this and to maybe then agree. So education is a key part for us to, to try to achieve the actions that we think could make a difference. Can you say anything today about the relative contributions of farming, farms, versus what's going on with uh, sediment from behind the dams. Yes, if, if there were, if in a watershed that is 100% forested, like Mountain Creek is nearly completely forested, um, and there's one dam, Eaton Dykeman, that has high banks and has failed relatively recently, another that's still in place, the Laurel Forge Dam, but if, if in that watershed you had several um, Eaton Dykeman type dams with eroding banks, that would be by far the greatest amount of sediment most likely because the rest of the watershed is forested. In agricultural watersheds like Chickies, Chickies is largely agricultural, with 42 breach dams, some of them re removed recently, so they're highly erosive, and then 10 dams still in place. It looks as if, and we're doing this right now, we're doing the calculations, it looks as if much of the sediment in that stream could be coming dominantly from the stream banks, the eroding stream banks, because there are so many eroding stream banks in that watershed. 
Now that we have, we just got some new 2019 LIDAR data that was just processed last year, and we just got it early this year. And we're taking that and differencing it with 2014 data. And we're able to see very clearly, because both data sets are so high quality, where are most erosions occurring. So we're focusing on chickies for now, for that reason, because we have, we know so much about it and have the LIDAR data. And we're gonna tackle that question, is comparing it to what they estimate to be sediment coming off the land from farm fields. We'll compare what we quantify, what we measure coming off the, coming off the stream banks from bank erosion in that six year period or five year period. So I think within a, a half a year we'll know for sure for that watershed. I would guess at least half of the sediment in that watershed is from those eroding banks. Um, and USGA is helping to fund the acquisition of that LIDAR, for example, and they even helped to put in a super gauge station with the USGS to monitor the stream for that reason, to try to understand the answer to that question better. Lots of this sediment, agricultural or from the former dams, is going down the Susquehanna. And as I've read recently, Apparently, a lot of it is trapped behind Conowingo and Holtwood and these other dams to the point that, I guess, pretty soon, lots of it will be just going over the dam. That's correct. Yeah, each of those is thought to have reached its capacity. And although they can get some scoured during storms, so some of that can get scoured out and then refilled again afterwards, in general, they're no longer collecting sediment. They're, they're at their equilibrium point. They're at capacity. So yeah, Pennsylvania, unfortunately, has a, this challenging issue of having a, a, a large watershed, a large part of the Chesapeake watershed is in Pennsylvania. There's lots of farming, there are lots of dams, and we lead the nation in low-head dam removal. So it's, it's a good time to come up with strategies for dam removal that don't worsen the situation. So we are working with Stantec Engineering right now to figure out a way to remove that roller mill dam so that it won't release 10,000 tons of sediment a year. Um. Uh, hi, Dorothy, thanks. Great talk, Ben Edwards in Neurosciences. Um, two questions, one is more a uh, community concern question maybe, as a fisherman, and you tell me you wanna take a stream and turn it into a marsh, <laughs> which, is, which is natural in the way it was, but. And you, you beat me to that question. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. You want me to stop there and you can answer? Okay. Um, so, I, so I just wonder, what, what, uh, if you ever have any concerns or people ever talk about that? And then the second question is, for places like Maryland, where it seems like a lot of the dams were breached a long time ago, have you ever actually been able to find a place that actually on its own, after a couple hundred years, is, is what looked like a stream valley that actually has gone back on its own to being a marsh? I don't think I have, and I think the reason is it, it takes more than 100 years, my hunch. Um, and then there's so much gravel piled up after it's migrated all the way across the valley. There's just lots and lots of that historic gravel left behind. I'll keep thinking about that. But for the marsh part, um, apparently there were plenty of fish in these valleys, plenty. Native Americans fished them. We found... Um, Susquehanna broad spears, and we've had archaeologists look at them, and I think Noel's son found one, and we found one, and we find them down there in that horizon um, and on the side slopes. There are numerous reports of people fishing these valleys, so at, they're, they're spring-fed. There's plenty of water, and it's clear water, and cold. it's very cold. It's cold water. So it's not as if they're stagnant, you know. They're not just muck. There's a lot of water flowing through them. And at Big Spring today, I didn't show any videos of it, but if you're out there during a high flow event, there's water everywhere, but you can walk around in it. And there are the tall sedges and so forth poking up. So the, the people we know who fish and who come to our sites tell us that they think that they would have been conducive, especially to the younger fish. I think downstream when the bigger parts, you know, the second order streams and the third order, Maybe that's where we would have found more of the types of fish we're thinking of. But like little Juniata, if you ever fly fish there, it's cold water, um, native trout. That probably had quite a few, it had a lot of mill dams, probably had quite a few marshes. But I suspect it was, with, there was so much groundwater, it was very conducive to fish, to fish habitat. 
they're like the Everglades in a sense. You know, there's a lot of water in the Everglades. You can go jet boating, you know, in the Everglades. I'm wondering about um, the the model that you have projecting into the future and thinking about the sampling of that. Right, there's just a few points at the long time scale and the impact of potentially really high magnitude events that have been undersampled and not represented in that. And maybe yeah. there's, maybe what, you showed us these great analog experiments and you know, maybe potential numerical modeling. So what are the roles of those things and kind of supporting that model and how much do you think that model might be underestimating yeah. the sediment? We, what we have learned by talking with landowners and owners of these dams over the years some of them kept telling us records that go way back in time from their parents and grandparents. What we've learned from them is that many dams failed during one storm. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be so surprised we'll be out looking at the remnants of a dam and the owner will come out and say, yeah, it failed in 1926. And it's like, okay, yeah, well, most of them seem to have failed in 1926. <laughs> I remember my grandfather talking about that big storm in 1926. And others will say, yeah, in Agnes, it failed in Agnes. And I've heard some managers, water resource managers in the region, talking about how after Agnes, the waterways were so different. You could just imagine that a lot of that length of that stream channel network happened after Agnes. Because by then, the dams were so obsolete and in such disrepair, and it's a lot of rain. And then even the, the roller mill dam, you know, much of the deterioration occurred after a few good storms. So. One, if we were to have a really horrific year or two of hurricanes, I could imagine five more dams in the Chickie's watershed going, you know. So I think you're right that it's going to affect that model. And we could play around, we will play around with that model some more to kind of test those ideas about these scenarios. But we did base it on erosion rate data from a wide number of sites. And it seems pretty consistent that the erosion rates drop in those first 20 years because of the change in processes. People refer to that as a change from, what is it they actually refer to it as? It goes from kind of process-based to something else-based, meaning that it goes from collapsing banks to just um, the retreat of the banks, which is largely due to the freeze-thaw, which Noel and Pete and others have worked on, and I have. That freeze-thaw tends to drive much of the bank retreat in the winter months today, but initially it's collapse. So I think the rates are pretty good. It's the timing of the dam breach that we need more work on. Dorothy, if, assuming that all the dams that are unbreached right now are at capacity with sediment, and you're doing this passive removal, it, would it be advantageous to start at the upstream or the downstream end? Is there a preferred end to remove the dams from, in terms of nick point retreat to minimize sediment? Yes, um, most of the engineers tell us they would like to start upstream, remove that one, and then work downstream, if, in the ideal scenario, if they could. I have to think about why they think that, but I guess you don't want to remove a downstream dam and then go upstream and remove yeah, one and this big slug of sediment come in. <laughs> but flush it over, you try to get... It's interesting that it almost reminds me of the response to the pandemic. Um, you know how with the pandemic, people were getting tired of it. They're almost ready to say, look, I'm just gonna live with it. Um, I'll get my vaccine, but I'll take off my mask and I'll, I'll go out again. Well, with dams, as we begin to understand the magnitude of the problem, we kind of have to live with it, right? There's so many of these things. We didn't quite realize how many, we didn't realize how much sediment, we didn't realize how much erosion. People thought for a long time, yay, just remove the dams and we're done, free streams, you know, it's all great, let's do it. Now we're realizing, oh, it's a little more complex than that. So we can, we can probably come up with, we're gonna to have to put up with some of the sediment. We can't stop all that sediment from being unleashed. But we can come up with ways to slow it down. In Maryland, they removed two dams recently. One was the Simkins Dam on the Patapsco, and the other was the Bloaty, and the Bloaty was down from the Simkins. It was a 35-foot dam. They, in the end, decided you know what, it's a lot of sediment, it's gonna erode fast, but it's kind of the equivalent of one big storm. So we're just gonna do it, and then we're done with it. And sure enough, it's in a gorge. It eroded a lot in the first few years. And they've kind of accepted that as a, something they just have to, have to live with. I don't think we can quite do that in Pennsylvania here, though. We're so tied right now to reducing sediment and nutrient loads 
we can't just, I don't think Maryland would like it if we said, we're going to remove 50 more dams and okay, you know. <laughs> State is working closely to figure out alternatives. Why don't we thank Dorothy once again for a wonderful talk. You're welcome.